neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many of you know the ending of this particular phrase. I brought you into this world. Right. There's an implied statement there, a phrase usually used by mothers who have had, just about had it with their children, and it gave my mother great joy when I told her one day that this is actually rooted in one of the Ten Commandments. Which commandments? Honor your father and mother. Well, you actually have to read the whole thing. Like, this is my big beef with people putting up the Ten Commandments. They only ever put up the one sentence. You gotta have the whole verse. Because the whole verse is honor your father and mother so that your days might be long in the land the Lord God is giving you. Honor your mother and father, you'll live a long time. And it has the implied opposite. Right? It's, it's, it's the... <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. Right? And, and we know how this works. If you think about the logic of how this would unfold, if you want to live a long life in the land, you will need someone to care for you when you're not 20 anymore. And how, were you, how will your children learn that? They will learn it with, by watching you take care of your parents, right? So if you want to live long in the land, you take care of your mama and daddy, and then your kids will take care of you. They'll learn it from having watching what you have done, right? So that, that, that's, it's right there in the commandments. Another uh, example of the need to tell the whole story, the whole context, it says that one of the, another Ten Commandments is, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Why? You got to read the whole verse. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. God created for six days, and on the seventh day God created rest. Created this day and made it, and made it holy. The, the first thing that God blesses in Scripture is, is this time, this moment to rest. And, and so why do we take a, a Sabbath, a day of rest? We take a day of rest because we are made in the image of God, and that's how God works. And so that's how we are meant to work. The context matters. We need to have not just what to do, but the context in which that teaching shows up. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at the teachings of the Old Testament, the law, this part of the covenant given to the chosen people through Moses. Remember that we are looking at covenants, right? The, the covenant, the relationship between God and God's people across the entirety of Scripture as it unfolds. And we had started with uh, Noah and the rainbow and look at the rainbow and see that the promise that there will never be another flood again and the, the promise of the covenant the relationship with Abraham that go into this land and it is your land and, and be fruitful and multiply and it's a sign of that covenant circumcise yourself to, to as you accept this and, and today we look at the receiving of the law that, that we received that this is the, the teachings of how we shall live once we have entered the land and I think it's important to be clear that when we're talking about law. When we talk about law, it often has this sense of like, when the law shows up, excuse me ma'am, I have some questions for you. Like, we don't have a sense of the law as a good thing. Like, the law can be a, a not, not something you get excited about. The law in, in, in Old Testament times it is understood to be a gift. It is teaching. It is something that you get excited about. There are multiple holidays around the law in Jewish uh, worship life, in Jewish culture. One of them is uh, called Simshat Torah. It's when you finish reading the, the, the Torah. So the, when, when a Jewish congregation, they get done reading the five books of Moses. They read through the same Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They read through all, all, the, all five of them in one year. And then when they get to the end of Deuteronomy and they're ready to go back to Genesis, they celebrate. Like they get done with Deuteronomy, the, the rabbi pulls all of the Torah scrolls out of the, the, it's called the tabernacle, and they dance with them. It'd be like the entire congregation getting up to do the locomotion, except being really excited, not just kind of like shuffling like usually happens. Like, that's what happens. They are excited. 
excited that they have received this gift in its fullness. There's another uh, holiday, um, Shavuot, where they, it's the, the receiving of the Torah. If you think of the timeline, the Jewish people, they, they leave Egypt, they go to Sea of Reeds, Red Sea, and they start crossing into the wilderness, and they get to Mount Sinai about 50 days later, and they receive the gift of, of the, the Torah, the, the teaching, the Ten Commandments. And, and so they celebrate that as a, hol as a church holiday. And, and it actually lines up with part of our church year as well, because Passover... What do we celebrate at Passover? We call it Easter, right? And what's 50 days after Easter? Pentecost, right? It's the same holiday. We don't call it Shavuot, we call it Pentecost, but it's the same thing. It's the receiving of an amazing gift, the receiving in our context of the Holy Spirit, which guides us in the same way that the law is guiding us before. Like it lines up. We celebrate that we have been given this amazing gift of what God teaches so that we might know how to live. So this is a wonderful thing that we receive this, and so let's take a look at at it. I gave you a list of 78, I believe. Yes, 78. There are 613 teachings in the Old Testament. I went through and pulled out 78 that are hopefully a representative sample, and we're going to take a look at those in a minute, because all, all uh, 613 take 11 pages, and I'm not going to do that to you. But uh, 78 of them. And, and so these teachings, they aren't meant to be understood as you have them in front of you. What you have in front of you are, are just one line. And that's not how they were given. They were given in a context. They were given at a point in time. Like the, the, when the Jewish people show up to Mount Sinai and, and, and Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, two tablets, and they have the Ten Commandments, he doesn't come down with all 613. It's not like he comes down with a textbook. I mean, that book hadn't been invented. But it's not like they come down with all of them all at once. He, they come down with the first ten. Let's start here. And then as they journey through the rest of Exodus and then the Numbers and, the, and, and all the rest of, of the five books of Moses as they go to the Promised Land, these are shared over time. Oh, you hit this new situation. Let's give you a little bit more. They learn as they go. It's, it's contextual learning. And, and so the, the way that context works... I, to show you an example of that, I want to tell you a little bit about Deuteronomy. So, Genesis, creation, Exodus, they leave Egypt, and then we have um, from the second half of Exodus through uh, Leviticus numbers is the story of them going to the promised land. And then as the Jewish people, they get to the promised land and they've spent 40 years in the wilderness. They're about to go into the promised land that is where the book of Deuteronomy is. In Deuteronomy, the name tells you what it is. Deutero means second. Well, it tells you what it is if you read Latin. Deutero means second. Nomos means law. You could also call Deuteronomy rehashing. Because what Moses does is he takes all of the law that has been given to that point, all the teaching, and he rehashes it in five speeches of Deuteronomy so that they know how to apply it where they're going. Because they've been wandering nomadic herdsmen. And so the teaching applies in a certain way when you're a wandering nomadic herdsman. They're about to be farmers as they enter the promised land. Different context. They're going to have to figure out how to apply it, and it's going to be different than it had been before. And so Moses takes this moment in Scripture to rehash everything that had come before the teachings to say, and this is how it applies going forward. The context changes, so what you do is going to change. And we can see this, again, I'll go back to the, one of the Ten Commandments. When the Ten Commandments are first given, the rationale given for why you take Sabbath is, you are made in the image of God. You need to live like that. And for people who are coming out of slavery, that's exactly what they needed to hear. Right? You have been enslaved. No, you need to hear clearly. You're not slaves. You are made in the image of God. This is how God lives, and this is how you need to live as well. 
Okay, that, that's what happens the first time the Ten Commandments are told. The second time, when Moses goes back and rehashes, the commandment doesn't change. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. But if you look in Deuteronomy 5, the rationale changes. Keep it holy, remembering that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So the first version, the first understanding, the first context is keep the Sabbath because you are made in the image of God and that's how God rolls, that's how you need to roll. The second context, same commandment, right? Keep the Sabbath. Now you need to remember that you were slaves. And you should not be enslaved again. Don't enslave someone else now that you're going to be a farmer and you're going to be in charge of people. And don't enslave yourself. Don't enslave yourself to the farm. Because to ask a farmer to take a day off, that's a statement of faith, isn't it? Right? This is, don't be enslaved to the farm. Remember, God took you out of slavery. Don't enslave yourself. And, and so this is just one example. Like, we could go through all of the law, all 613 teachings, and we could unpack the context of each of them and, and say, like, what does it look like to reinterpret them today? We're not going to do that. It took me two and a half months to cover the Ten Commandments. We would be at it for at least a year if we were to do that. And I'm not going to do that to me or to you. But I do think it's important to see that this is, again, part of the, the covenant, which is what we're looking at for this month, the way that God first begins with receive the rainbow, the gift, receive this relationship and live, and it's very broad. Everyone who can see the rainbow, the promise is for you, right? And then the next part of this covenant is unpacked. It's, it's here, receive this land. Anyone who is Abraham or a descendant of Abraham receive this land. And now we're getting more, more specific. Now that you're in the land, here's how you're going to live. Here's the teaching, here's the law for how you are to live now that you, you are in the land. And so if you grab this, we can take a look at how specific and how, how impressive this teaching is. Like if you, you take a look at this, it starts out with what you expect to be covered. The first couple, one, two, three, are talking about worship. Like, do not try the Lord unduly. Emulate God's ways. Then it starts talking about community. Number five, love other Jews. Love converts. Then it starts talking about relationships. Eight, tell someone that when they've messed up. Eleven, twelve, do not take revenge. Do not bear a grudge. Then it starts talking about till we have to learn. We continue to learn. Number 13, continue to learn. Down in 31, each male must write a Torah scroll. I mean, keep on learning all of your life. Think of how long it would take to recopy a Torah scroll. It, it'd take a while, right? You get down to 15. Now we're talking about foreign policy, right? To burn a city that has turned to idol worship, do not rebuild it, do not profit from it. Number 21, do not sacrifice your children to Moloch, a, a god, a, a local god of the times. Uh, number 28, to wear a tefillin and put a mezuzah on each door. This is talking about uh, public faith. Like a, an Orthodox Jew has a little leather case that's on their forehead and on their arm that has, in, in the case, is a, a rolled up uh, piece of paper that has the scripture, the Ten Commandments, written on it. And, and then the mezuzah is a plaque that you put next to the entryway to your house and it has the, a very small copy of the Ten Commandments on it. But you never nail it in so that it's perfectly square. It's always a little bit off kilter because if you were to put it up perfectly square, you'd be cl claim, claiming that this household lives perfectly by the Ten Commandments. And that would be slightly arrogant. So it's a little bit off kilter. So that's how you know you're entering a Jewish person's house. I think it's pretty cool. And you can continue on. Uh, number 35, be fruitful and multiply. You flip the page over. We, number 46, leave the corners of your fields uncut. When you harvest grain, leave the corners so that anyone who's willing to work can go out and get the grain and eat. Uh, number 48, this is one of my favorites. To set aside a tithe and give it to a Levite. Who is a modern-day Levite? A pastor. This is otherwise known as pay your pastor's salary. It's a commandment. It's in the Bible. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Number 50, to work the, not work the soil during the 50th year, to carry out the, the law of sold family properties and not sell the land in Israel indefinitely. This is business practice. In, in this way of living, Every 50th year, all land reverts back to the original tribe. So that, if you decide to do something truly profoundly stupid, and you sell the land, your grandchildren will get the land back, so that no family is doomed into generational poverty. Like, that's economic policy. It's in there in, in the Bible, in the, in the Torah. To offer only unblemished animals, 53, to offer your best. To light a fire on the altar every day, to worship as a way of life. Uh, number 57, I like, I like this one too. The Sanhedrin must bring an offering when it rules an heir. The Sanhedrin would be like the legislation, the, the governance. And so when, a government, when the government messes up, they can't slide it under the rug and just move on. No, the Sanhedrin, the people in charge of the Jewish state, have to show up at the temple and publicly make an offering when they mess up. How's that for public transparency? I really like that one. Right? Each individual must ensure that his scales and weights are accurate, not to move a boundary marker. That's business practice, right? That's business, business ethics. You can't stand by idly if someone's life is in danger, number 60. You have to put guardrails around flat roofs, number 62. Now, that's positively meddling, isn't it? But it's necessary. You don't want people falling off your roof. Conduct sales according to Torah law. Do not overcharge or underpay for an article. Do not insult or harm people with words. Lend to the poor and the destitute, and don't press them for payment if they don't have it. The court must not punish anyone who is forced to do a crime. Now we're getting into legal systems, ju justice, right? Must, the judge must not accept testimony unless both parties are present. You gotta have both sides. No one is to destroy food even during a siege, the care of nature. Right? You, you can't let your idiocy, your arguments, destroy the ability of other people to eat. Prepare latrines outside the camps. This seems like a good idea. Prepare a shovel for each shoulder to, soldier to dig with. That, that would help the previous one. Appoint a priest to speak with the soldiers during war. They have chaplains. He who has taken a wife, built a new home, or planted a vineyard is given a year to rejoice. Like, you can't be sent off to war if you've just been married. Like, war is never more important than sitting down and enjoying the first year with your family. And so if you go through these, is there anything, any part of your life you can think of that was not just covered? It covers just about everything, doesn't it? Every, and the, the, under, the Jewish understanding is that from Moses and on, every generation has the responsibility to accept the gift of the teaching and struggle with the question, how do we live this today in this context? The teaching, the law of God, it is still applicable. The question is, how does it apply? And so, have you ever found a Jewish elevator? That's not a bad joke. Look, here's how you know you found a Jewish elevator. If you go into an elevator on the Sabbath, which would be Saturday for a Jewish tr tradition, and it stops at every floor, you're on a Jewish elevator because you shall not work on the Sabbath. And pushing a button to tell a machine what to do is work. And so it stops at every floor. That, that, that's the, the challenge. How do you take... Now, that might not be how we apply honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, but that is what we are to do. We are to take these, and you look at these, and you can start asking, how do we apply these? Like, do not pass your children through the fire and sacrifice. Well, how does that apply today? Have you ever seen children sacrifice to their parents' addiction? Right? That, that, I think it does apply. Right? To bind a tefillin on your arm, like I don't think, I'm not going to pass out little leather cases, but I do think we live our faith in public. I, I think that is something we do. 
All right. To each male must write a Torah scroll. I, I don't think that every one of us should start rewriting the, from Genesis and just start rewriting as we go. But to learn continuously, because there's always more to learn in the Word of God, I, I think that, that's good. I, that's Bible study, that sounds like to me. Right? To, to go through this, we can go through and we can see. No, we, no one here is setting aside a corner of your... your no one here is ha harvesting a field and setting aside a corner so that those who are hungry might have something to eat. But this church does have a food pantry. And maybe every tenth can we buy at a grocery store needs to go to our food pantry so that people have something to eat. Right? So how do we apply these things today is what we are charged to figure out. To sit down as a community and in worship and to prayer in prayer to figure out how does this work for us. For Jesus tells us, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. This is Matthew 5. Right? And following Jesus, we are fulfilling the teaching of the law. Even as we struggle to understand parts of the context, even when we're not sure how it applies today, we follow Jesus and we are fulfilling the law. And it is in following Jesus that, that we need to study the law so that we know more about how to follow Jesus. Because he was, as you might remember, Jewish. And, and so we have this law to struggle with. And we have to be honest that there are two cop-outs that we are tempted to make. Here are the two cop-outs. I have heard them before. You probably have as well. One cop-out for just taking all the Old Testament law and just punting on it, or doing sort of a buffet theology, is to say that the Old Testament law can be divided into the ceremonial and the civic and the ethical, and we don't have to deal with the first two, and we just decide what's the ethical. Like that ceremonial law, that doesn't apply. We don't have a temple, right? Or, or the civic law, we don't live in a, a, a theocracy, so that doesn't apply to us. Let's just look at the moral law, and so we can go through and do like a buffet theology thing. We just take what we want to deal with out of the Old Testament. No. Right? All the sacrificial law helps us understand what it means when Jesus is sacrificed, so we don't get to ignore it. We have to learn from it, because it's there to understand, help us understand who Jesus is. Right? To understand that just because it doesn't apply cleanly doesn't mean it doesn't apply. We just have to figure out how to do it. The second uh, cop-out, the second way I've heard people to sort of take Old Testament law and dismiss it, I've never heard a better example of it than when a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine is a, another pastor, and he was meeting with a member of his congregation, a banker, and this banker told my friend, you know, business is business and church is church. Right? And, and we understand that logic, right? Because you go back into the 1800s, there was this moment in American history in which uh, uh, our way of life was divided. When men went off to the factory, it became sort of men and job and politics and public, right? And that was all public life. And then private life was women and children and education and church. And we have this sort of public-private divide. And, and let's just look at that list of Torah uh, again. Does that list of Torah care about that divide? No. They had just as much to say about who you do business with as who you sleep with. And it's pretty explicit about both, right? When we open up our hymnals to one of my favorite hymns, number 354, I Surrender, it doesn't say, I surrender some, I surrender some, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender some. Right? That, that's not what we sing. I surrender all. Like that, that's what Jesus claims. When, when we say we're going to follow Jesus and Jesus is Lord, th that's what we're saying. And so when Jesus says, I come to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, we are left with this understanding that the covenant that God offers to us is that God has given us all of this amazing teaching about how to live. 613 teachings, commandments, each with their own context. And we are to take those and they are to help us understand who Jesus is, and then as we try to figure them out, we look at who Jesus is and we say, well, Jesus fulfills them. And so if any of those pieces of law is contrary, seems to be contrary to who Jesus is, well, then let's look at Jesus and figure out how to read law in light of Jesus. It's the sort of back and forth, law and, and Jesus. And we know that in the end, we follow Jesus, right? As we, and as we follow Jesus, we know that we are fulfilling the law. This is the covenant that God offers us. 
receive this gift and live. And the gift is, I will give you all the teaching you could ever imagine about how to live, and here are your tools to help follow Jesus so that you might have a life of peace and joy. Amen. And he stops crying. I notice these things. Subtle hints. I invite you to stand with me and join as we confess our faith together 